have a normal random variable, not a standard normal one, the first step, the preliminary step is converting your interval of values of a normal random variable to an interval of values of a standard normal random variable. And so this was an example where we found the probability uh, of a of a normal random variable by by converting it to probabilities of a standard normal random variable. Okay, so so you know, we had this, and then I, I wrote down the steps. Okay, okay, and so we have a homework due on Wednesday. Okay, seven. homework seven. Okay, so now let's let's start with with this class. Um, so we're going to start with another example. So example. Um, 5.17. Okay, suppose that um, any given day's gross receipts uh, thousands of dollars uh, from why did I just change? There are ten thousands of dollars uh, from a certain sales unit uh, may be treated as a normal uh, random variable. Complex with parameter uh, mu equals twenty and sigma equals two. Find the probability that so a um, that the gross receipts on a certain day are between fifteen thousand dollars and twenty-five thousand dollars. So I'm going to mute everyone. Okay. Um, so let's find the answer to this. Okay. So the example again: suppose that any given day's gross receipts in thousands of dollars from a certain sales unit can be treated as a normal random variable x with parameter mu equals twenty and sigma equals two. Okay. So I'm going to highlight that part. Find the probability that gross receipts on a certain day are between Fifteen thousand dollars and twenty-five thousand uh, dollars. So okay. So what we want to do is we want to find the probability that gross receipts are between fifteen and twenty-five thousand uh, dollars. Okay. Uh, and so we know that X is in thousands, right? So we know that this is a probability. Uh, 15 less than x less than 25, right? X is thousands of dollars, and so we want the thousands of dollars between 15 and 25. Okay, so now we want to convert this probability to a probability involving a standard normal random variable. Uh, so in order to do that, we first think, okay, we have our, oops. so first we have 15, and if we if we take 15 and we subtract from it mu, which is 20, and then divide by sigma, which is 2, that's strictly less than x minus 20 divided by 2, which is strictly less than 25 minus 20 divided by 2. Okay, so what I did was I took each of these, I subtracted by mu which is 20, and then divide by sigma, which is 2, okay? And so if you take these two inequalities, are the, this, the solutions to this inequality is the same as the solutions to this these two inequalities, okay? So we're not changing the values of x that satisfy the inequalities here or here. It's the same set of x values, so the probabilities are the same. Okay, now... Um, Given any normal random variable x, if you subtract it by its mu and divide by its sigma, you get a standard normal random variable. So here we have negative 5 over 2, 
strictly less than a new variable of whole z, strictly less than five halves. And so now z is x minus 20 over two, where z is equal to x minus 20 over two, okay? And z here is a standard normal random variable. So I'm gonna give myself more room here. And then, so where z is this, um, where z equals this is a, stand, is a standard normal random variable. R, R, B, R, point, R period, B period means random variable, is abbreviation of random variable. Okay, so now we have, a pro now we want to find the probability of a standard normal random variable between these two values. Okay, so we, we apply the symmetry of this probability, and so this is equal to the probability um, that zero is less than z, less than five halves, uh, but then it's plus that same probability, right? So it's plus the same thing. So it's two of these. It's two times that probability because we're just seeing that if you take the center point, zero, and you flip the negative five halves to zero, you now have a sum of two of them. And so you can use now the table to find this probability and then multiply it by two. And then that is, um, and that's the problem. And that one's solved. Uh, okay, so I'm going to bring up the table. Okay, so uh, here we go. Okay, so here's the table. And so the probability we need is uh, zero less than z less than five halves. Five halves is 2.5. So let me just we go here. So this five halves is 2.5, right? So this is really, um, so all I'm doing here is converting a fraction to a decimal, but just so that it, this makes sense. This is 2.5, right? So the tables and decimals, and so I'm just converting this fraction to a decimal so it's easier to read the table. Okay, so let's go, to the, now let's go to the table. And so we need 2.5. So we scroll down. Let me scroll down. Okay, so you have 2.5 and 2.50. It's point not 0.4938. So, so zero less than z less than 2.50 is 0.4938 right there. See? 0.4938. That's that's when you have this little z here. This is 2.5, 0.4938. So 0.4938. This is equal to two times. 0.4938. If you multiply two times that, you get 0.9876. Okay. 9876.9876. Okay, so that's part A. Okay, so now we found that probability. So for part B, um, for part B, we want to find um, the probability that gross receipts are more than $24,000. Uh, okay. So in order to find that probability, we want to find the probability that the gross receipts are more than $24,000. Right, okay, so X is in thousands. This is the probability that X, the number of thousands of dollars, is greater than 24, all right? And well, that's equal to the probability. Now you do um, X minus mu, which is still 20 up here, right? And divided by mu, which is two, strictly less, uh, strictly greater than, tw than 24 minus 20 over two. So we want to know the probability of that interval, but that's just equal to the probability of our new standard normal random variable defined in terms of x. Z equals x minus 20 over 2. Probably that that z is greater than 4 over 2, which is 2. Z 24 minus 20 is 4. 4 divided by 2 is 2. Z is x minus 20 over 2.
think this is where z is equal to x minus 20 over 2 is a standard normal random variable. Okay, so we want to know the probability that z is greater than 2. So the probability that z uh, is greater than 2, that's 1 minus the probability that z is, is less than or equal to 2. Right? And then that's equal to 1 minus, in brackets, some of the probabilities that z is less than 0 plus the probability that 0 um, is less than z less than 2. And so I just, the probability of z being 0 individually doesn't matter, right? So we don't have to worry about that. And the probability that z is equal to 2 exactly doesn't matter because it's a continuous random variable, right? So finding the probability of one particular value doesn't matter, it's 0. Okay, so this is the probability. This is 1 minus uh, brackets. Now, z is centered at 0, right? So, so probably z is less than 0 is 1 half of 0.5. Okay, and then you're taking that and you're adding to it the probability that 0 is less than z less than 2. Okay. And so you just plug in this probability in the table, and then you calculate. So, so we want little z equal to 2 here. We want to find this in the table, where z is a standard normal random variable. Okay, so for z equal to 2, right, probably 0 less than capital Z less than little z, where little z is 2, 0 0.0, is 0.4772. So it's 0.4772 here. Okay, 0.4772. So that's 0.4772. Remember that 0.4772. Okay, so that's I just substituted the probability of this there. This is one minus in the brackets is 0.5 plus that, which is 0.9772. One minus 0.9772 is 0 0.0228. And that's the answer. And so for B, the probability of gross receipts being more than $24,000 is 0 0.0228. Okay, and so that's A and B, for example, 5.17. Any questions? Okay, so that is the end of Chapter 5. And so we're going to keep going. Okay, very good. Okay, so that's the end of chapter five and so next is chapter six okay so chapter six is on mathematical uh, expectation and 6.1 is on the mathematical expectation of a random variable So let's do that. Okay, and so okay, so um, okay, so the so the most important um, okay, so so when you have a random variable, there's several there's different quantities that you can use to study it, and so the most important number associated to a random variable is the expected value. Okay, so the most important number associated with a random variable is the expected value, okay? okay so in 6.1.2, uh, we talk about the mathematical expectation, E of X definition, uh, 6.1. Okay, so the mathematical expectation of a discrete random variable, capital X with probability function uh, f of x is the quantity d 
e of x, which is equal to the sum the sum over all values x of x f of x. Okay, provided Okay, so provided that the sum, provided that the sum, except you have the absolute value of x here. Assuming that that sum um, is finite. And this is so the series uh, converges absolutely. Right, so this is the first definition. Okay, so the mathematical expectation of a discrete random variable x with probability function f of x is the quantity e of x, which is equal to the sum over all possible values of x with x times f of x, provided that the absolute that the series absolutely converges meaning that the, abs the sum of the absolute values of the terms um, is convergent, is finite, um, right? F of X is not negative, the probability function. And so you're technically taking the absolute value of every term in the sum, which is the absolute value of X times F of X. But since F of X is not negative, its absolute value is itself. And so the absolute value of the product of X F of X is the absolute value of X times the absolute value of F of X, which is itself. That's the absolute value of x f of x is the absolute value of x times f of x. Okay, so if you're wondering why there's an absolute only an absolute value sign around the x, it's technically around the entire, it's it's technically an absolute value of every term, x times f of x. It's just that it doesn't change f of x. So it it, it can change x though, because x could be negative, but f of x can't be negative. Okay, so that's the definition. Um, and also um I'm just gonna write down what I said aloud um, that that the sum that the sum over possible values of x that denotes uh, summation over values of x that are possible values of uh, the random variable capital X. Okay, so capital X only take on certain values. You can't take on any possible value. So X takes on certain values, and so we're summing over the little x as little x ranges over all possible values of our random variable capital X. Okay, so if capital X can only take on the values of one, two, and three, then this sum will only be taken for x equals little x equals one little x equals two and little x equals three. Okay, so we'll see examples. Okay, also, uh, so notation, um, e of x, right, is also uh, denoted by mu, okay, which represents average, okay? So e of x and mu are both notations in this context for the same thing. Okay, so that might be a little confusing. Example 6.1. Let capital X be the numerical outcome uh, of one roll of a die. Find uh, E of X. Okay. Find the mathematical expectation of X. And so once you see the solution, mathematical expectation will start to make more sense. Okay, so we want to find E of X. So when you roll a die, there are six possible outcomes, right? So the possible, um, so, uh, so X is the value of the resulting roll, right, of the die, right? So the possible values of capital X are one, two, three, four, five, and six, right? 
Okay, so the probability function of capital X is, well, uh, so the probability of, of capital X being little x is one sixth, right? For X equals one, two, three, four, five, and six. Right, so that's the PDF, right? The probability of rolling a one is one six. The probability of rolling a two is one six, three, four, five, and six, right? So that's the probability function of, of capital X. Now, uh, the mathematical expectation of X, E of X, is equal to, according to this definition, this, this sum of products, right? So we have that E of capital X is equal to that sum as little x ranges all possible values of capital X. So that means that the only values of little x we're going to consider is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. And so it's going to be 1 times f of 1 plus 2 times f of 2 plus 3 times f of 3 plus 4 times f of 4 plus 5 times f of 5 plus six times f of six. See that? So we're just taking this product x times f of x, and we're adding over the values of the x from one through six. So we're just substituting from one through six and adding up those products. That's what this summation symbol represents. It represents this sum. Okay, okay and so now it's just a matter of plugging in the values into this function, this PDF of x, and then substituting the values in and then adding the products after we substitute. So this is equal to one times f of one. f of one is one sixth. This is one times one sixth plus two times f of two is also one sixth. So f is one sixth for all these values. This is three times one sixth plus four times one sixth plus five times one sixth plus six times one sixth. See that? And so now you just multiply it all that out and add. I'm going to factor out the one sixth. This is one sixth times the sum of one plus two plus three plus four plus five plus six. Okay, and so that's equal to one sixth times. Now the sum from one through six is six times seven over two. Uh, so that's 21. Okay. Whenever you add the first n positive integers, it's equal to n times n plus 1 over 2. The sum for 1 through 6 is 6 times 7 over 2. And so you get 21. You can check that 3, 6, 10, 15, 21. So they add up to 21. Okay. So I'll put that as a note. Uh, if you add up the, the positive integers from 1 up to including n, 1 through n, that's equal to n times n plus 1 over two, and that speeds up that calculation. So this is just six times seven over two. And six over two is three, so it's three times seven, which is 21. Okay, so then it's one six times 21, which is 21 over six, and that's the answer. Okay, so the expected value is 21 over six. And that says a fraction, as a decimal, it's 3.5. Okay, so the expected uh, value is of x, the mathematical expectation of x is 3.5. And so now that problem is done. Okay, so that's example 6.1. Let's do now another example, example 6.2. Uh, so let capital X be a discrete random variable uh, with probability function uh, f of x is equal to um, uh, is equal to so is equal to one third um, for x equals three and two thirds for x equals equals nine. And so the problem is find E of X. Okay. 
Okay, so we're going to find e of x, so solution. Okay, so e of x, remember, e of x is equal to the sum the sum over all possible values of capital X, little x of x times f of x, provided that the series absolutely converges, right? And now, if you find this sum, okay, so this, this everything's positive here. So by calculating it, you're seeing that it's absolutely convergent, right? You see how values of x are positive and probably zero is positive. So, so finding this sum is also finding, if you find this sum and it's finite, you're also proving that, it's, that the series is absolutely convergent. Okay, so you plug in, so this is equal to three times f of three plus nine times f of nine. And so this is equal to three times one third plus nine times two thirds. And so that's one plus six, which is seven. That's the answer is seven. One plus Nine over three is three. Three times two is six. So this is one plus six, which is seven. Okay, so the, the expected value of x for this example is seven. Okay. Uh, next is definition six point two, and so the mathematical um, expectation of a continuous random variable. A capital X with probability density uh, function f of x is the quantity e of x, which is equal to definite, which is equal to the integral uh, from negative infinity to infinity of x f of x dx provided the integral exists okay so this is definition 6.2 um, and this is the mathematical expectation of a continuous random variable x with probability density function f of x Okay, so if you calculate this, if this integral exists and you find its value as a finite number, that's the mathematical expectation of your continuous random variable capital X. So let's do an example. So this is example 6.3. Uh, let capital X be a continuous random variable with probability density function f of x is equal to and so now the bracket is going to be here that's 81x squared for zero less than x less than one third then zero elsewhere And so now we want to find um, e of x. Okay. So the goal is going to be to find e of x. So to find e of x, we just need to calculate that integral. So the solution. Okay, so the solution is e of x is equal to this right? and so that's equal to uh, the only place where f of x is non-zero where where f of x matters is in this interval uh, so we can restrict this integral to zero to one third okay and now we're finding 80 of 81 x squared as the uh, as the integrand so you just calculate that so this is 81 times an antiderivative x squared is x cubed over three and then you evaluate it from zero to one okay 
Uh, and so now you're just taking an antiderivative x squared and move the 81 out of the integral, f integral. And then so an, inter an, an antiderivative x squared is x cubed over three and you evaluate from the lower limit to the upper limit, zero to one. Okay, so this is 81 times, um, so times uh, one cubed over three, which is one third, minus zero cubes over three, which is zero. Zero cubed over three is zero. Okay, so you have 81 times one third, that's 27. Okay, 80, uh, 81 is three cubed, uh, no, three, nine, three. It's 81 is three to the fourth. Three to fourth divided by three is three cubed. That's 27. Okay. Did I, wait, wait a second. Uh, oh, oops, okay. Sorry, this is X times that. And so this is, uh, Okay, this is x times it. So, so you have 81 times the def integral uh, from zero to one third of x times x squared, which is x cubed dx. Okay, so that's the integral we have to calculate. This is 81 times now an antiderivative of x cubed is x to the fourth over four. And then you're evaluating that from zero to one. And so this is equal to 81 times uh, 1 fourth minus 0. And so this is 81 over 4. Right. Now what? Um, oh, this is 1 third. <clears throat> okay, so when you, sorry, when you plug in 1 third here, uh, you get 1 third to the fourth. Um, okay, and so you get one over, you get the fraction one over 81 divided by four and then minus zero. <laughs> so now, okay, so now uh, you multiply 81 times one over 81 over four and you get one fourth. There we go. Right. Okay, and so that's the, any questions? Okay, so next is 6.1.3, and this is on uh, y e of x is called uh, the mean of capital X. Uh, so this is example, to illustrate that this is the example 6.5. Uh, a class of Kaplan students um, is given a test. Uh, the possible grades are A, B, C, D, and capital F. Uh, with numerical uh, values four, three, two, one, and zero, respectively. Suppose we choose a student at random from the class and let capital X be the numerical grade uh, obtained by that student. What is E of X? Okay, so this is the next example. Uh, a class of N students is given a test. The letter grades are A through F and number values are four through zero respectively. Suppose we choose a student at random from the class and X is that student's numerical grade. Question is, what is E of X? Okay. Uh, so solution. So we're not given the odds, right, of each uh, of each letter grade or each number grade. We can 
mind. So solution, let n sub x equal the number of students with grade x. This is going to be a fast way to refer to the number of students with a grade x. Well, with that notation, f of x is equal to the number of students of a particular grade divided by the total number of students, right? The probability of a grade X is the number of students with the grade X divided by the total number of students. And so it's that for X equals zero, one, two, three, and four. Okay. Also, uh, the expected value of X then is equal to the sum over all possible values of X of x times f of x, as long as the series is absolutely convergent. The sum of the, of the absolute value of the terms is finite. Well, then this is equal to the sum over all possible values of x. Now it's x times f of x. This is f of x. And so it's x times this quantity in place of the probability. And so now we have that. OK, all right, then that's equal to uh, that's equal to, now n is just a, a number, and so you can just factor that out. And then in the numerator, you have everything else. And so in the numerator, you have the sum over all possible, you have the sum over all possible values of x, of x times n sub x. Okay? Uh, because it's x times n sub x, and then the one over n is in every term, and so you can factor it out. So, okay. so then this is equal to, well, if you think of what these expressions mean, the sum over x of x times n sub x, this is the sum of grades by students in the class. So if you take all possible grades, x, and you take the products, the grade times the number of students who got that grade. You take that entire sum of products and you get the sum of grades by students in the class. So for instance, if you take, let's say little x equals one, you would say one times n sub one, one times the number of students who received a grader of one. When little x is two, you have two times the number of students who got a grade of two. And so if you add those products, you're adding all the grades received in the whole class. Okay, so the numerator here is the sum of grades by students in the class. And capital N represents the total number of students in the class. And so this value here, this fraction, is the sum of grades in the class divided by the total number of students in the class. That's just the average, right? So that's just the average grade. This is the average grade. So the expectation of x here is the average grade. And so that's why e of x is called the mean of x. Okay, and so that example illustrates why it's called that. So the mean of capital X is interpreted here as the average of the values weighted by their frequencies. Okay, so we're weighting each grade by the number of students who received that grade. Okay, uh, so that's why. Okay, so let's do another example. This is example 6.6. .6. Um, show if capital X is the number uh, selected at random uh, from a finite set of numbers, then Capital E of X is the mean of the set capital A of numbers. Okay, so let's do that. So suppose, let's use some terminology to represent this set capital A. So suppose capital A is equal to the set uh, whose elements are A1, a2, A2, A3, dot, 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 A sub N, right? So the set A 
from a finite set of numbers, right? So this finite set of numbers is a. Okay, so since it's finite, there's a certain number of them. And so I'm letting little n denote as the index, the number of distinct elements in the set. So a1 to a n can be used to represent capital A. Okay. Um, and this is such that um, a sub i is a number. Okay. And this is for one less or equal to i less or equal to n. So, so that's the set A. Okay, so now F of X, sorry, F of A sub I, the probability that you choose a particular value of A, but this is the probability that X is equal to A sub I. Right? X is the number selected at random from the set. So if X is A sub I, that means you selected the number a sub i from that set. Uh, well, that's equal to the fraction uh, k sub i over n. And this is for um, i equals one, two, three, four, dot, 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 up to including m. So let me explain that. Okay, so, so, okay, so these are not necessarily distinct, these a's. So the k sub i is the number of times the a sub i's repeat. So k sub 1 is the number of times a sub 1 repeats. OK? k sub 2 would be the number of times um, a sub 2 repeats. And so, so this is where um, this is where k sub i is equal to the number of elements in capital A that equal A sub i. Okay. Um, okay. So another way to express A is that the set A, which I, I, I don't know here, that A is equal to A1, A2, dot, 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 A sub M, where each A sub I for one less equal to I less equal to M now is distinct. Okay, so these A's are not distinct, they're just numbers, right? So you could repeat numbers here, right? Instead, if you express your set A as from A1 to A n, where each A sub I is distinct, right? Then when you talk about each of these A sub I's, um, you can you could then also talk about how many times it appears and you don't have intersection. So for instance, A2 is not the same as A1. So K2 is not gonna be referring to the same thing as, as K1, right? Here, there's a bit of ambiguity, right? So since you have repeated values, you don't want, if A1 and A2 are repeated, you don't want K2 to represent the number of times A2 appears and K1 to represent the number of times A1 appears if A1 and A2 are the same, right? Then you're, you're adding repeatedly the same thing, right? Okay, so, um, so what we want is, uh, so, so you can think of it this way, okay? Um, so now E of X, the expected value of, of our random variable X is equal to the sum from I equals one to M where there's M distinct values in the set of X sub I F of X sub I, right? It's just taking each of those possible values in the set of distinct elements in A and then you're taking that value times its probability. Okay, now, so if you do that, now you just need to find this sum, right? If it's, if it's absolutely convergent. Okay, so um, in all our examples, they're absolutely convergent. So here, 
the f of x of i is k sub i over n. Okay, it's the number of times that value appears in the original set divided by the total number n, little n of elements in the set. Okay, it's not m because little m is the number of distinct elements, little n is the total number of elements. Okay, um, so now this is equal to, um, so keep in mind the n is a constant, and so we can move that outside of the sum. And so we could actually just have n by itself in the denominator. And then um, and then you have what's this? And then you have from i equals one to m of x sub i k sub i. Okay. And so now that's e of x. And so what is that sum in the numerator? The sum of x sub i k sub i from i equals one to m. Well, you're taking each distinct element in the set and multiplying it by the number of times it appears in the set and then adding those products. This is just adding all the values in the original set. This is a1 plus a2 plus a3 plus dot 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 plus a sub n divided by n. And that's the mean. And then this is equal to uh, the mean of the set capital A of numbers. Okay, so again, this sum here, right? This sum from one to m is referring to the sum over little m, where m is little m is the number of distinct elements in the set. And then you're taking each of those distinct elements, multiplying it by its, their frequencies by by how many times they appear in the set. And so if you take each element, multiply them correspondingly by how many times they appear in the set and add those products, you're really just adding all the elements in the set, except you're doing it in a way where you group all the similar elements, all the same elements, right? So instead of adding one plus two plus one plus two, you do one plus one, two plus two, right? Plus two plus two. You'd have one times two plus two times two. It's that kind of a thing, right? So instead of adding all the elements in the set directly, you're grouping them into the ones that are the same, and then you're taking each value and multiplying them by the number of times they appear in the sum. And then you're adding those products, and that's just a faster way of finding the total sum. Okay, and so that's why this sum represents the sum of all the elements in the original set. And you're dividing by n, and when you add everything in a set and divide by the total number of elements in the set, that's the mean of the set of numbers. So the expected value is the mean of that set. Okay, and so we accomplished the goal we were trying to do. We want to show that E of X is the mean of the set A of numbers. The mean of the set A of numbers, right? That's E of X. And so we are now done with that example. Okay, so the next section is 6.1.4, which is on the strong, uh, strong law um, of large numbers and why. E of X uh, is called the mathematical expectation of capital X. Okay, so let's do theorem uh, 6.1. This theorem is on the strong law of large numbers. So let capital S be an experiment with sample space capital S. Okay, let capital X be a random variable defined on capital S with E of X equaling to mu. If capital S is repeated n times under identical conditions and x of i is the random variable 
Apple X on the I performance of Apple S. Then the probability of the limit adds n approaches infinity of the fraction x1 plus x2 plus dot 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 plus x sub n divided by n is equal to mu. That probability is equal to one. Or we expect the average of many observed values of capital X to be approximately equal to E of X. Okay, so I'll, let, I'll, I'll give you a minute to look at this before I keep going. Um, okay, so this is theorem 6.1, the strong theorem of strong the strong law of large numbers theorem. Let capital S be an experiment with sample space capital S. Let capital X be a random variable defined on capital X with its expectation equal to mu. If S is repeated n times under identical conditions, when X sub I is the random variable capital X on the i performance of S, then the probability at the limit of the sum of those values of X over N is equal to mu is equal to one. Or we expect the average of many observed values of X to be approximately equal to E of X. Okay, so what does that mean? So you have an experiment, um, you have an experiment that you repeat and X is the random variable, right? So you just, you make X of I the random variable for each repeated experiment. So when you repeat this experiment n times, x sub one is the value of the first time you do the experiment. X sub two is the value of the second time you do the experiment and so forth. X sub n is the value the nth time you do the same experiment, okay? So x sub i's are just the values of x for the i time you do the experiment. So if you add up the resulting values of n times of your experiment and you divide by n, right? You see that's the average of the values you get by repeating it n times, okay? So what the strong law of non non large numbers theorem says is that as you take n to be arbitrarily large, larger and larger, this average of the values of the experiment should be approaching mu, the expected value, okay? It should be, meaning the probability that it does, the probability that this average limit, that, that this, that this average approaches the expected value is one. It's 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 it would be high. It would be you wouldn't even you you can't expect that that wouldn't happen. Or we expect the average of many observed values. This is the average of this is the average of observed values. So if little n is large, that would be the average of many observed values of x, right? So this says by we expect. We're saying the probability is one of something, right? So we expect the probability that the average of many observed values of x is approximately mu, right? And so since you take many and not infinitely many, many means that this average should be close to mu. You're approaching mu. And so if you take many observed values, the average will be very close to mu. Okay, should. Okay. Uh, and so that is... Um, the theorem, right? In practice, just like you can't add infinitely many, actually do an experiment infinitely many times, you can't actually observe um, this probability. So that's why it says we expect the average of many observed values of x to be approximately equal to e of x. And so if you were to practically use this, you would be looking at the word many here. You would take a little n very large, many, you would do the experiment many times, and then the average of the values 
should be very close to the expected value. Okay, and so that's what this theorem says. Okay, so let's do an example. So example, um, this is example six point seven. Uh, suppose um, capital X is the length of life in years of a certain type of battery. Then f of x is equal to three fourths times two x minus x squared. This is for uh, zero less than x less than two, and then zero elsewhere. Okay, so suppose x is the length of life in years of, of a certain type of battery, then that's the PDF, right? X. Okay, so for A, of this problem, of this example, uh, show that the expected value of x, e of x, is equal to one. All right. So e of x is equal to. This is a continuous random variable. You can see that by the way we define the PDF. So e of x is equal to then the the integral from negative infinity to infinity of x f of x dx. And so then that's equal to, well, again, the PDF is only non-zero between x equals zero and two. So we can restrict this integral to zero to two. And then we have x times the PDF there, which is that. And so now we have it times that, and then dx. And now when you calculate this integral, uh, I'm going to move the three fourths out. Okay. And then you have the def integral from zero to two of x times that. Well, x times that is 2x squared minus x cubed, the x. And so this is equal to three fourths times an antiderivative of the integrand, which is two thirds x cubed minus x to the fourth over four. And then this is evaluated from zero to two. Okay, and so you evaluate that. And so this is three fourths times, now when you plug in two, you get 16 thirds minus, Four, and then minus zero. So you have that. And so this is three fourths times. Now sixteen thirds minus four is sixteen thirds minus twelve thirds, and so that's four thirds. And so now you have three fourths times four thirds, and that's one. Okay, so um, that's equal to one. Okay, so I give two weeks advance notice for the exam. Uh, so it's not yet two weeks before the exam. Um, so I'm not announcing it yet. It's gonna be near the end, right? So uh, two weeks from today is the 10th, okay? So, uh, okay, so I'm gonna announce it probably next class, okay? Okay, so uh, the last day of class is the 17th, right? right I believe so. Um, so, okay, so I checked that for you. Uh, so it's, it should be the 17th. Yeah, so, so the 17th is the last day of weekday classes. Um, okay, so the 17th is the last day. Uh, so two weeks from today would be the 10th. And so we have three weeks left. So um, 
Okay, so I'm going to announce it next class. Okay, so, so you can imagine what it might be. Okay, so I'm going to, next class I'm announcing um, exam dates. Okay, so, uh, so that's part A. And then part B is if we bought 2,000 batteries, we can expect um, the average length of life to be uh, one year, All right? Um, by the strong law of large numbers. Right, remember it, the conclusion is we expect the average of many observed values of X to be approximately equal to the P of X. So if we bought 2000 batteries, that would be many batteries, right? So we can expect the average length of life of these 2,000 batteries to be one year, the expected value. Okay. And so that's the statement for B. Okay. And so that's the end of 6.1. And so now next is 6.2 applications. Okay. Uh, and so 6.2.1 is on what's called FAIR. Uh, games. So definition. Um, a fair game is one in which the expected um, net gain of each player is zero. Okay, so a fair game um, is one in which the expected net gain of each player is zero, each of them, right? So all of them, right? An example of a non-fair game would be if you go to a casino, right? So in a casino, the game is rigged to favor the casino, and that would not be a fair game because in the long run, you're, you're expected to lose, right? But a fair game is one where the expected net gain of every player is zero. In the long run, it's expected that you'd end up even. That would be a fair game, okay? And so it doesn't mean that you'll win half, you're expected to win half the time. It means that, that your net gain is zero. All right. So if you were to make, it may be possible that you're less likely to win, but when you win, you win more, and you're more likely to lose, but when you lose, you lose less, and somehow they they um they balance each other, and in the long run, you'll expect it to be even. So, okay. So fair game does not mean that you're likely to win. It means that the average of your earnings, the average value of whatever it is your look values you care about that the average of those values is zero, okay? So again, it's not saying the, the probability is 50%. Uh, so this is example 6.8. Um, in the game, Shuckaluck, um, a player uh, pays $1 um, and chooses um, one of the numbers from one through six. Three dice are then rolled. And if the number he or she chooses appears one, two, or three times, the player receives two, three, or four dollars, respectively. Is this fair game? If not, what should the fee be to make this a fair game? Okay. So two questions there. So let's let's answer it. Okay. Okay. So again, in the game Check a Luck, a player pays one dollar and chooses one of the numbers from one through six. Three dice are then rolled, and if the number he or she chooses appears one, two, or three times, the player receives two, three, or four dollars, respectively. Is this a fair game? If not, what should the fee be to make this a fair game? That's the problem. Okay, so let's solution. Okay, so let capital X be the net gain of the player. Um, in units of one dollar. Okay, if the fee is 
one dollar, the possible values of capital X are, well, okay, so, um, so we're counting it in terms of dots, individual dollars. So if the fee is one dollar, right? Um, if the player, when he rolls three dice, right? Um, if if he sees the number one, two, or three times, he makes money, right? If he doesn't see the number at all, he doesn't make anything, and so he just loses one, right? So his his total value would be minus one if none of the three dice rolls are the number he chose, right? He would just lose the fee that he paid for, for it. Now, if his number appears once, he would receive $2. And so after paying a fee of $1, he would receive two. And so the net gain would be one, right? So the next possible value of X is one. Now, if his number appears twice, he would make $3 and he paid a $1 fee. So his net gain would be two. And then if his number appears three times, he would make $4 after paying a fee of one. And so his net gain would be three. Okay, so you see how the possible values of X are negative one, one, two, or three, right? Okay, depending on how many times uh, the number that the player chose appeared in the three dice rolls, right? So if you roll three uh, dice, right? It could, the number can only appear zero, one, two, or three times. And so that's why we're getting four possible values of X. Okay. So to find the probability function of capital X, consider each roll of die as a Bernoulli trial. And the appearance of the chosen number as a success in that trial. And the probability of success is one sixth, and the probability of X, the probabilities of capital X are the following. So the probability of X equaling negative one, that would be in a Bernoulli trial. Um, well, in Bernoulli trials, it would be the probability of zero successes out of three total trials, where the probability of success in any given trial is one sixth. Right. So this is the, uh, the this is the probability of right. You have three total Bernoulli trials. You have zero successes. Probability of success is one sixth. So the way again you calculate this is then you have. Um, so you want to choose, uh, okay, so you have three trials. You want to choose zero out of three to be successes. Okay, you have a probability of success, which is one sixth, but you succeed zero times. And you have a probability then of failure five sixths, and you want to fail all three times. And so if you calculate that, three choose zero is one, this is one. And so it's just five six cubed, which is 125 divided by 216. And so that's a probably x equals negative one. Okay, five, six cubed is 125 or 216. Okay, next is uh, the probability of x equaling to one. Probably the x equals one, right, is the, is the probability that you have one success still in three Bernoulli trials, where the probability of success is one sixth. And so you calculate that, and so when you calculate that, you have um, you have three Bernoulli trials. You have one success out of the three to choose from. You have one sixth to the first, one success, five six failure, and you're going to fail twice. And you calculate that, and you get seventy five out of two hundred and sixteen. Next, the probability of x equaling to two, right? That's the um, that's two successes out of three Bernoulli trials where the probability of success is one sixth, right? Because X equals two means that you, two of the three dice rolls uh, were the number you chose. So that's two successes out of three Bernoulli trials. Uh, so you want to choose um, two out of the three to be successes, three choose two, 
times the probability of one sixth, the probability of success uh, squared, two successes, and then five sixths, the probability of failure, then uh, raised to the first power. Then you calculate that and you get 15 divided by 216. And then you have the probability that x is equal to three. And so the probability x equals three is then uh, three successes and three total Bernoulli trials, probability of success is one sixth. And then this is equal to, um, you wanna choose three out of the three to be successes. You have one sixth, you have one sixth, uh, one sixth cubed, three successes. You have five sixths is failure, but you have zero failures. And you multiply that and you get one divided by 216. Okay, and see these are the probabilities of each possible value of x. And so that implies, that tells you that the expected value of x, which is the sum of all possible values of x of x times f of x, if that sum is, is, is absolutely convergent. So you, when x is negative one, you have negative one times 125 divided by 216 plus x value of one times the probability when x is one, which is 75 over 216 plus uh, x is two times the probability that x is two, which is 15 by 216 plus x is three times the probability when x is 16, which is one divided by 216. And so you add all that up and you get um, negative 17 divided by 216. And as a decimal, that's negative 0 0.0787. So that's the expected value of this experiment. There we go. So that's the expected value. Okay. So the game is not a fair game, right? Uh, that's since uh, the expect uh, mathematical expectation of capital X is not zero. Okay. So you are expected to lose about eight cents on average. every time you play, okay? That's the expected value. Um, okay, so now before I, before, before we're done, I just wanna finish this example. Uh, so we're almost done. Okay, good. So, so now in, in uh, the next part, we have to show we have to find, to now find the new fee in order to make this a fair game. Okay, so let K denote the fee. Then the expected value of X is equal to, um, well, if your number appears zero times, right? Um, and you pay a fee of K dollars, then, um, so then you make zero dollars and you paid a fee of K dollars, the probability of your number never appearing is 215 over three, 125 over 216, right? This was the probability that none of your numbers were chosen, right? So the probability that none of your numbers were chosen was this, was this. So if none of your numbers were chosen, that means you, you made zero dollars and you paid a fee of K. And so that's part of your expected value. Next. Plus, if your number does appear once, then you make $2 and you pay the fee of K dollars. So two minus K is your net gain. But the probability of your number appearing once is, 20, is 75 over 216. So 75 over 216 is if your number appears once. And your number appearing once means that um, you, know, you receive $2, the original problem. So you receive two, you pay K, your net gain is two minus K, and you multiply your net gain by the probability of that being your net gain, which is the probability 
uh, your number appearing one time. Plus now the probability of, well, okay, so first, if your number appears twice, you make $3 and you paid a fee of K dollars. And so then times the probability of your number appearing twice, which is 15 divided by 216. Then plus the prob then plus if your number appears three times, you make four dollars and you pay the fee of k dollars. So your net gain is four minus k times the probability of your number appearing um, three times, which is four minus k times um, 216. Okay, and so now we have that plus in the sum. I'm gonna move this plus here, and then it's gonna do that. Uh, Okay, so then there you go. So E of X is equal to that value. And so um, if E of X is zero, then this equation is saying that zero is equal to this whole thing. Right? So then you set that equal to zero. Now, if you set solving for k, we get uh, that k is equal to 199 divided by 216. That's decimal, that's 0.92, okay? And so uh, our conclusion is that in order to make this a fair game, you need to set the fee at 92 cents. Or ninety two or, or ninety two cents, which is point ninety two dollars. I'll put it that way. Okay. And so now we we've now found the fee to make this a fair game. And so that's the end of that section. Okay. So, so this is the end of today's class. Okay. Um, let me quickly check to see if what about the homework. Um, so I signed. Homework seven, right, is due on Wednesday. Okay, so make sure to do homework seven. Um, okay, so make sure to do homework seven. And then homework, homework eight, we're not yet, uh, right, we're not yet up to that. Um, okay, so that's good. Okay, so just homework seven is due uh, next class. Let me check. Okay, good. So I'm going to write that down and then we're good. Okay, so reminder, uh, I assigned this last class. Reminder, uh, homework seven is due next class on Wednesday. Okay, and I will announce the uh, third exam, the second exam date next class on Wednesday. On Wednesday. Okay. Okay, and the last day of class is uh, four, is five, um, 17, 2021. Okay, so it's on the 17th. That's our last day of class for this class. Okay, uh, 17, yeah. All right, so that's it for this class. Uh, thank you for being here. I'll see you. Um, yes, the final one is cumulative. Yep, the second exam is only on uh, new material on it, those. The second exam is separate from the first exam material, but the final is cumulative. Okay. Uh, you can look at the syllabus online if you go to Blackboard and on the menu bar, if you go to syllabus, 
you can open the syllabus and that reminds you of the material on both the first exam and the second exam, which is coming up and the final schema. Okay. All right. So see all of you on Wednesday. Good night. Hey, everybody. Thank you for being here. You're welcome. Bye, everybody. You're welcome. Good.